Amen. Amen. Uh, our call to worship this morning is found in 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'll be reading verses 13 to 22. 1 Peter 1, verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that you, your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you, Lord, for in your mercy and grace you have called us from the world, uh, called us from a life of sin, Lord, that you have set us free, delivered us from the bondage to sin and Satan, and you brought us into fellowship with you, Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, you've redeemed us not with perishable things of silver and gold, but with the precious blood of your Son. We thank you, blessed Father, O Lord, for adopting us into your family, that we could be called children of God. Lord, what an amazing, benefit, Lord, privilege that we have to be called children of God. Uh, Lord, we, one time we were children of Satan, but now we are children of God. Hallelujah. And we can come, Lord, as your children into your throne room because of our advocate, Jesus Christ, the, our, the righteous one, the holy one, Lord, the one who obeyed you and who uh, redeemed us by his precious blood. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, Holy Spirit, for your presence with us, where you said where two or three are gathered, I am in their midst, Lord, and we are confident that you are here, Lord, and we thank you for your word that speaks to our hearts, and Lord, your song and prayers and breaking of bread, every aspect of our worship. These are means of grace you've given your church, Lord, to build us up in our most holy faith, to sanctify us. And we ask that you would accomplish your purposes in our lives, Lord. Father, encourage, encouragement where that's needed, Lord. Exhortation where that's needed, Father. We pray rebuke where that's needed, Lord. Correction, Lord, where that's needed, we pray for salvation for those who are yet outside of Christ, that you would speak to their hearts today. Today would be the day they would come to know the Lord. Oh, Father, we pray, Lord, as you are holy, that we would become a holy people. Lord, as, as the word would come in a powerful way to challenge us today, we pray, uh, Father, that it would come with freshness and your spirit would enable Pastor Joe, who is not feeling uh, himself today, Lord, with having this cold, we pray that you would be his portion and strength, that he would be able to preach with the help of your spirit. We pray for our brothers and sisters, Lord, who are not able to be here today. Uh, Lord Jesus, we think of the Chiagoros and others, Lord, the Chows who had, had some sickness and Arun's daughter, uh, Mahima. We pray for each of them that they would know your strength and their weakness. We pray for restoration. Uh, Lord, and we, Lord, that they would be able to gather with us again to give you worship and praise. And we ask, Lord, as we, uh, in every aspect of our worship, you would assist us, Lord, in prayer. You assist us in praise. And 
assist us, Lord, in hearing of the word and the breaking of, uh, of bread, uh, that every aspect of our worship would be spirit-owned and spirit-empowered. And we commit this day to you, Lord, thanking you, uh, thanking you for uh, the promise that you would be with us and that you would be glorified in us. And we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first song is in the songbook number 31, Children of the Living God. And uh, you may see it on the screen. Hmm. Morning, church. This, uh, this song gives me a, the proper perspective, I feel, of being a child before God. Doesn't God's word say, unless you become as little children, you never enter the kingdom of heaven? This song kind of makes me see a scene of just dancing before God's throne as a child. Just, just the knowledge of knowing you're a child of God brings the joy to your heart. So let's sing, Children of the Living God. Let's stand. the wonders he has made, bird and flight, falling rain, sing of the wonders he has made, sing to the living God. How he loves us with great love, he who sits in throne above, for our lives he's filled his blood. Of his gentle healing hands, how they found the Lord's man. Sing of his gentle healing hands, sing to the living God. Sing of the mercy that he gives, for we sin, he forgives. Sing of the mercy that he gives, sing to the living God. Please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. You can turn to Psalm chapter 14. It's on page 397 of your Black Pew Bibles. We're going to be reading the entire Psalm, which is in the Black Pew Bibles. It's the New American Standard. We're going to read it right out of the Bible. So this Psalm, with just a few alterations, is repeated in the 53rd Psalm. And as we've said many times, Repetition is the mother of learning and one of the best tutors. So uh, God in his providence wanted his people to have this psalm reinforced. And this psalm, uh, one of the commentators summarized it as deliberations on depravity. As this psalm is filled uh, not so much with praise to God, 
as it is with the theology of natural man and the reality of atheism. God, uh, man's natural desire to escape God's control and to be his own boss. And that may not be as much of a temptation to us for those who acknowledge God and who are in Christ, but yet the uh, temptation of practical atheism is always around us, especially in our culture, which acknowledges that God exists, but lives as if he doesn't. Lives in a way where we deny God uh, with our lives and we serve the God, the triune God, the idolatrous God of self, of me, myself, and I. So let's read the entire chapter. Chapter 14, Psalm 14, Folly and wickedness of men for the choir director, a Psalm of David. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all the workers of wickedness not know who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great dread. For God is with the righteous generation. You would put to shame the counsel of the afflicted, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores his captive people. Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be, will be glad. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we ask that you would help us to be faithful. Save us from practical atheism. We want to be real Christians. Save us from that fake and phony, just go through the motions type of people. Empower us by your spirit so that we can be faithful to defend and extend your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing this hymn 405 and celebration hymn, though. I love thy kingdom, Lord. turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. One of my fondest memories from childhood was my dad taking us to Shea Stadium in Flushing 
to watch the Mets play and usually lose. <laughs> Though through most of my childhood, the, the Mets were not particularly a good team. And offensively, they were particularly anemic. Uh, once in a while when um, uh, either Lee Mazzilli or Felix Mion or Dave Kingman would actually get on base, the fans would break out into a chant. And they would say, let's go Mets, let's go Mets. And the purpose of that was to encourage the team's anemic bats. There was, in a sense, a feeling on the part of the fan that he or she was part of the team effort to win the game. Whether or not that works, I don't know. Uh, is fan support actually helpful? Uh, certainly uh, not true for every sports team individually, but home teams do have a statistically significant greater chance of winning in their home stadium or their arena. And one of the reasons seems to be the vocal support of their fans. But again, whether or not that's true is difficult to prove. But what is certainly true is that every Christian is part of a team effort, as it were, to win eternity. In our text, in Hebrews chapter 12, we'll be looking at verses 12 to 17 today, I find a corporate exhortation to help one another run the Christian race, particularly when one becomes weak or discouraged. I find the corporate language to be very clear in this text. I get the idea uh, from the language of verses 12 and 13 that talk about body parts, drooping hands, weak knees and feet, body analogies almost always direct us to the corporate nature of the church, which is called the body of Christ. And I also see uh, corporate language in verses 14 and 15, as we'll see. So the title of this message is Let's Go Blank, taken from that Met fans chant, meant to encourage the weak and the feeble team. Hebrews chapter 12, let's read it beginning in verse 12. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one shall see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would speak to our hearts. We are certainly hopeless to understand your word apart from your spirit. But Lord, with your spirit speaking to us, Lord, we know that you can open up eyes and ears to hear what you would have us to hear today, that we might be conformed, both individually as well as corporately, into a church that is formed after the image of your Son, a true body of Christ, as we are called. We ask, Father, that you would be glorified in our midst, in Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews chapter 12 employs athletic imagery describing the Christian life as a race. In verse 1, the author of the epistle exhorts, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Before this, in chapter 11, the author goes through this litany of Old Testament witnesses which begin at the beginning of time and conclude with Jesus as the supreme example of all those who have run the race and finished the race, living by God-pleasing faith. He tells his audience, to whom he is writing the letter, as well as us, that we are in the same race as they were in and that we could look to those who have gone before us, starting with Abel all the way to Jesus, look at those examples who've gone before us, who've made it, who finished the race, so that we would be encouraged that we will finish as well. 
Then in verses 4 through 11 of chapter 12, we saw last time, he calls us to endure this race as hardship, as discipline, a discipline that is designed by a good and heavenly Father for our good. We saw last time that whether it was reproof or discipline in general, that God, as our Father, ordains trials in our lives and suffering to help us to grow. And he does this because he is a good father. He does this because he is training us as his children. But the author concedes, at verse 11 of chapter 12, he says, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Trials can be, and perhaps for these discouraged new Jewish believers in the first century, perhaps these trials had already become uh, discouraging to them. And it is a common reaction when you're discouraged or when you're suffering, the common uh, reaction is to give up. That's why you have this regular exhortation throughout the whole book of Hebrews, particularly in chapter 10. Hold on to the faith. Resist falling away. Don't abandon the faith. Don't give up. Keep going. But even with these exhortations, there are times when trials get very heavy and the people of God start to turn inward and they start to rely on their own resources. They don't ask for help, whether it's pride or just a simple desire to not want to be a burden to others. Rather than seek out help, Christians will try to fight the battle alone. We don't reach out to the church for help. We think, hey, I got this. I've been through this before. I'm I'm a man. I could do this. I'll just do my thing and and isolate until I get over it. But as we're going to see in our text today, it is instead true, brothers and sisters, that we need to enlist others in our struggles. We need others. Other, we need brothers and sisters to cheer us on, in a sense, to help us to finish the race. And I find this to be the main idea of the text that we're going to look at together today, which I'm going to look at in three points, three exhortations, or three imperatives. Uh, this uh, section is laden with imperatives. Verses 12 and 13, pursue the weak. Verse 14a, Pursue peace. And verses 14 to 17, pursue holiness. Let's begin with the first one, pursue pursue the weak, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, therefore, in light of the discipline that we just read about in training, therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather healed. Hands, knees, and feet, pictures of strength and agility. Hands fight, but when they're weak, they drop. Hands hold up a shield of faith, but when you're holding it up for too long, hands can become weary and droop. Knees keep us moving, but when knees become weak, the body can buckle. Feet can travel in a good direction or can take us where we ought not be. With drooping hands and weak knees, we could falter in our walk, our shield drooping at our side, we can limp along in the fight, and we become prey for Satan's temptations and schemes to get us to fall. The paradox, though, is that the thing that makes you want to quit, namely the tiredness, the weariness, the thing that makes you want to give up, is the very thing that can keep you from quitting. Think about this analogy. Uh, If you've run on a treadmill or lifted weights, you know this to be true. It's hard when you start out. When When you get going, your muscles are sore. But that soreness is the very thing you want to feel. Even though it doesn't feel good at the time, that's what you want to feel because you know you're building up your muscles or you're building up endurance. Likewise, God builds builds faith through trials. We don't like them, but they do build our faith. 
Now, this analogy of the body in Hebrews is a reference to Isaiah chapter 35. So turn to Isaiah 35. Isaiah, the prophet, in chapter 35 is speaking of the coming kingdom. And he's using the glorious future return of the exiles to Zion as an encouragement for these people in their exile. And in verse 3, he says those same words quoted in Hebrews in verse 3 of Isaiah 35, strengthen the weak hands, make firm the feeble knees, say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come in vengeance with recompense of God. He will come and save you. See, he's calling Israel here. He's encouraging those who are anxious, those who are weak, saying, be strong, fear not. He's calling on the people actually to, to encourage one another. Strengthen the weak hands. Make firm the feeble knees. He goes on in verse 5 to speak of their future. He says, then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness as streams in the desert. Going down to verse 8. He says, a highway shall be there and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow. And, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Isaiah is saying in the words of Paul in 1 Thessalonians, Encourage one another with these words. The days of exile will soon be over. Strengthen the weak. Encourage the faint-hearted with the promise of his coming. The promise of their good future. And just as these exiles looked ahead to the, their return to Zion, we as God's people await a new Jerusalem where there will be gladness and joy and all sorrows will cease. And brethren, the most direct path to that place, the best path, is the straight path. And that's what the author of Hebrews says in verse 13, back in Hebrews 12, verse 13. He says, make straight paths for your feet. Straight paths for your feet. This is linked to what Isaiah 35, verse 8, called a highway, or the way of holiness. Some have called it the highway of holiness. The straight path is the safe path and the quickest path, the path of the least resistance, in a sense. The highway of holiness is the direct line to heaven. But as travelers on this straight path, we are prone to wander, become dislocated, become isolated from our brethren, and thus be in danger. So we need to, in the words of the author, identify the weak limbs, the strained ligaments, the pulled muscles among our brothers and sisters. Maybe once they were running well, but now they're kind of limping along. And we are to do what we can do to help them back to the highway, come back onto the highway, smoothen out the path for their feet is what this actually means, that straight path. Smooth out the path for their feet so that all of the team members can complete this course without losing one. That's our goal, brethren. Or as verse 13 concludes, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint. In other words, may not become dislocated, isolated, dislocated, but rather what? Be healed, back part of the body. Brothers and sisters, as we look around at those in our church who are suffering, we are charged to lift a drooping hand, to strengthen 
a weak knee to smooth out the path of the lame. And there are times in every Christian's life, it may not be now, but that time can and will come when they feel weak and weary. But God has placed us in a family, the church, with brothers and sisters. And we're all headed in the same direction. We're all in the same race. And these are the brothers and sisters with whom we will finish the race. We are called, brothers, to weep with those who weep, to rejoice with those who we rejoice. Among the many ideologies of the modern church that the church must repent of is the self-sufficiency, the thinking, I'm good, I got this. I, we have to repent of this. We need to repent of our live-and-let-live attitude toward one another. The megachurches need to repent for their uncaring role in creating Christian consumers who are comfortable walking in the doors and walking out merely as a number. The church must repent of selfish attitudes that show little concern for others, little concern for who you sit next to on a Sunday morning. So much of the modern church is all about self-discovery, individualism, personal freedom, relevance. You will hear sermons about you and maybe your family. But this is not the way God designed the body to work. We must pursue one another. This is the way the New Testament commands us to live, brothers and sisters. We must love one another. How is it possible for any Christian to obey God apart from membership in a church, apart from loving one another? Fifty times in the New Testament is a command to do something personal, not general, but personal for other Christians. These are not general exhortations. They, they are linked to people. Let me just go through. We're going to mention about 20 of them. Love one another 16 times. Romans, be devoted to one another. Honor one another above yourself. Live in harmony with one another. Build one another up. Be like-minded towards one another. Accept one another. Admonish one another. You know, sometimes we read this and we take the general principle, but we have to ask ourselves, who am I doing this with? Who am I doing this to? Am I admonishing anyone? Am I accepting? Am I like-minded? What am I doing? 1 Corinthians, care for one another. Serve one another. Bear one another's burdens. Forgive one another. Be patient with one another. Be kind and compassionate toward one another. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Submit to one another. Look to the interests of one another. Bear with one another. Teach one another. Comfort one another. Encourage one another. Exhort one another. Provoke one another to love and good works. Show hospitality to one another. Employ the gifts that God has given us for the benefit of one another. Clothe yourself in humility towards one another. Pray for one another. Confess your faults to one another. It's a lot. The overall posture of the Christian life is to live continually before the face of God and with one another, never by ourselves. Isolation and individualism will be the death knell of your faith. Because apart from the church body, you will become stagnant, lethargic, and weak without even realizing that it's happening. That shield that you hold in your hand, that shield of faith will begin to droop. And on your own, you're going to be at risk for Satan's darts piercing you so that you might fall away from the faith. There's this wonderful illustration in Roman warfare that just so perfectly illustrates the Christian safety in spiritual warfare. Roman armies, in order to stay safe from the onslaught of the barbarian attacks, would stay together in a single unit. And what they would do is they would take their shields and they would stand overlapping their shields, shields side by side to shield, one in front and one overhead, also overlapping. 
and they move together as one, the perfect rank with ordered steps. So that when the barbarians would throw their flaming arrows and their spears, it would hit the shield and bounce off. That's a beautiful picture. This is the way, brothers and sisters, that we're going to withstand our ancient fo foe. He has taken his aim upon the church. And believers who choose isolation can be taken out by a single spear, no matter how strong you think you are. This is no time, no time to leave the body of Christ. This is no time to undertake anything on your own. We need everyone in this army. We need to move together in step with our shields upheld. And if we see a brother or sister in our midst who's struggling, who's limping along, drooping that shield a bit, weak in the knee, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. Pursue the weak so that they may be strong again, so that they then in turn would strengthen others. What this means practically for us at Bread of Life is, first of all, know who the members of this church are. Know the members. These are the ones who've joined the infantry, joined this infantry. Pray for them, reach out to them, hear their prayer requests, visit their homes, join with them in the life groups on, in, in, during the week. Join the monthly corporate prayer meetings, read the prayer requests. Join, our, join us today after service when we pray for one another. Don't say, yeah, I'm convicted by this, I'll make it next month. Join us today as we pray. When you don't see them at church, reach out to them. Let them know you're thinking about them. Maybe they're going through something and they need prayer. Pursue the weak in this body with the goal that they would be strengthened. And don't give up on them until they give up or they move away or they join another body that they're accountable to. And this goes for all of us, brothers and sisters. There's no one too strong or too weak. Brothers, sisters, pastors, deacon, it doesn't matter how strong you think they may be, we all need each other. Do everything that you can to help them. And prioritize your fellow church members. It's great to have friends in other congregations. That's wonderful. Uh, you have your homeschool community, you have your bowling buddies, you have your singles ministry, whatever, the people you go evangelizing with, the people you go to the gym with, all well and good. But don't allow your efforts with the others outside of the local church keep you from engaging the local church's needs and battles. What I'm saying is prioritize your fellow members. You say, but that, that, that person, they're on their own. That, listen, that Lone Ranger Christian who you're helping out, they need to join a church so that they can become accountable. Don't enable them. We give to our church first. We do not neglect our family. And listen, if you're not a member here, or you're not a member of any church, it's time to join a body of believers to whom you can become accountable, with whom you primarily serve, the ones who are primarily praying for you. The implication of these verses is very practical, brothers and sisters. Pursue the weak in the body. Secondly, pursue peace, verse 14. Verse 14 says it very clearly. Strive means follow after, pursue peace with everyone. It's only fitting, right, if we're going to run in this race together and if we're going to fight in this fight, fight together, that we have peace among our ranks. Peace refers to harmony, like-mindedness, or unity and forbearance. It's a, it's a kind and compassionate demeanor toward one another, one of humility, one of service. Uh, let me remind you again of the repetition of those one another statements throughout the New Testament. I won't name them all, but from Romans, live in harmony with one another, 
Be like-minded toward one another. Accept one another. Romans 12, 18 says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. From Ephesians, forgive one another, be patient with one another, be kind and compassionate to one another, submit to one another. And in Ephesians 4, 3, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit, which is the bond of peace. Elsewhere, we're commanded, look for the interests of one another. Clothe yourself with humility towards one another. 2 Timothy 2, verse 22 says, Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call upon the Lord from a pure heart. Brethren, there is no room in our ranks for individualists who refuse to strive for peace in the body. Harmony, love, like-mindedness, acceptance, forgiveness, patience, compassion, mutual submission, humility. Listen, this is no time in this race for pity parties and offenses and divisions and grudges, impatience, strife, rebellion, and pride. Better not join the army than introduce a hole in that armory because someone else could hold that shield up. That's why at the Lord's table each week we say if you have conflict with another member, you're better off not partaking, partaking of the Lord's Supper until you resolve that conflict, resolve the conflicts with one another if there be any. The pursuit of peace is essential for our advancement and our survival in the fight. Listen, the enemy of the church would seek to devour our peace. You could be sure of that. How do we know that? Well, unity is something specifically mentioned in the scripture that pleases God. So if unity pleases God, Satan is going to do what he can to disrupt unity, right? He's tried this before in our midst. And to some measure, he has succeeded. And he will try again. Satan will show you some weakness in this body that you can complain not only to your spouse, but to others about. And suddenly divisions come from within the church. Don't think that just because you're a Christian and you have good intentions that you cannot be used of Satan. There will always be self-occupied, self-infatuated people who live among the church. They are the ones who like to be heard, and they are the last to serve. And if you recognize this in yourself, brother, sister, if you recognize in this in yourself, it's time to conquer it. It's time to mortify. Mortify this pride. How do you do it? Look for opportunities to serve one another. That's the best way that I know. Sit with one another and listen to one another. Listen, resisting the inclination to tell them how to fix it. Listen and weep with them and rejoice with them. Don't accept any petty jealousy in yourself that would keep you from being able to do that. Envy makes peace impossible. Being judgmental or hypercritical makes peace impossible. And our little outpost here in Wayne, New Jersey will only survive as much as we are at peace with one another, strive for it. Pursue the weak, pursue peace, and lastly, verse 14, pursue the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Isaiah said there's a highway. It's a trodden down smooth path that's been traveled, it's smooth and trodden down because it's been traveled by God's people throughout the ages. And it's called the way of holiness. Now it's one thing to pursue holiness, but Hebrews specifically adds this, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. In other words, without holiness, there is no salvation. The way of Jesus, Jesus is the way. The way of Jesus is the way of holiness. 
The way of true saving faith is the way of holiness. What's holiness? Holiness is a life in conformity with the moral precepts of Scripture in contrast to the sinful ways of the world. Putting it according to Ephesians 4, it's putting off the old self with its deceitful desires, putting on the new self, recreated to be like God in righteousness and holiness. To live a holy life, we must see the utter sinfulness of sin. Even the smallest of sins are against God. All sin is breaking the law of God and is not His way. It's going off the path. It's straying. It's um, drifting. It's unbelief. It's a lack of faith. And God calls every Christian to be holy as He is Holy, right? Holiness involves righteous living, making self-sacrificing decisions. Holiness is believing and obeying the one another commands as well as all the commands of Christ. Holiness is mortifying any known sin and guarding your heart against further temptations. Holiness is laying aside every weight and the sin which easily entangles. Holiness often involves sacrifice or a blow to your pride or the death of some besetting, darling sin. Holiness requires vigilance. That is, that we carefully watch and pray over our souls lest we enter into temptation. That's what holiness is. Three things, though, that holiness is not, lest you... Be mistaken. One, holiness does not merit salvation. The scripture is clear on this. Countless occasions, we are, we are not saved by our works. The best of our works are polluted and imperfect. And that's why Christ came to be the sinless, perfect sacrifice, to live the life that we were obligated to live but could not. And his holy and righteous life is then placed on our account so that we are counted holy. Hebrews 10.10 says it that way. That's our positional holiness or positional sanctification. Hebrews 10.10 says we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We are positionally holy because of the work of Christ. While our positional holiness results in practical holiness in the life, Though this is something we strive for, nevertheless, it's the grace of God that teaches us, right? The grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness, worldly lusts, to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. It is the same way, by grace through faith that we're saved, by grace through faith we walk. Abraham obeyed God and went where he didn't know why, by faith. Holiness does not attain merit. Holiness is also not perfection. As long as we live in this body of death, we will struggle with sin, brothers and sisters. We will battle the flesh, and there are times when we will fall. We will, will, as long as we walk in this life, be putting off and putting on. And while we are being changed and conformed to the image of Christ from one degree of glory to another, We are not made perfect until the perfect one comes. Until then, even while we are positionally holy by faith in the finished work of Christ, we practically live out holiness. We work out our holiness by the grace of God through faith. Holiness does not merit salvation. Holiness is not perfection. And thirdly, our text tells us holiness is not an option. This is made clear here in the text. There's no other way to understand this. We are commanded to pursue holiness. The author says it, without which no one shall see God. I don't care what kind of gymnastics you want to do to try to wrench that out of context. It's quite clear. The holiness that he's talking about here is the practical outworking of a holy life. And we know that because it's something we're commanded to strive for. 
While our positional holiness is the basis for our holy living, and holiness is a gift of God that requires faith, nevertheless, we're commanded to pursue it, to chase after holiness. And listen, if there is the absence of at least a, a, a yearning desire to be holy, if, that, if that's not there, then you have to call into question the genuineness of your salvation. You say, I don't, I'm not growing quickly. Well, well, sanctification is often a slow process. It may creep along at almost an imperceptible rate at times, but it will always be present in every believer. I've always said it's quite simple. New birth necessitates new life. You have, if you have a birth without a life, then you, that birth was in vain. You believed in vain. And we need to be aware of the subtle evil of the antinomian gospel that's presented by today's dispensationalists and other evangelicals who deny the necessity of repentance and the call to holiness. This is a false teaching in the church. Ephesians 1.4 tells us that the very reason that we are chosen in him before the foundation of the world is that we would be holy and blameless before him. The mission of Jesus, told to Joseph in Matthew 1, you shall call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And that refers to the consequence as well as the power of sin. And this is what makes the whole Bible make sense. Otherwise, you've got to throw out the book of James. Where James 2, he says, faith without works is dead. Not that works are required to get onto the narrow path that leads to life, but that narrow path that we're on by grace has a name, and that path is called the highway of holiness. So if you're following Jesus, you're on his way, the only way, the only way is that you would strive for holiness. Now, this holiness is personal. It's individual. But sanctification is also corporate. Christians are called into a body, an assembly of believers, who experience the same Holy Spirit together. And with rare exceptions, apart from the body of Christ, sanctification is impossible. With rare exceptions. Because any time I say this, some brother or sister always say, well, what about if I was in solitary confinement or in some foreign country and put in... Okay, yes, God makes a way, but you're not in solitary confinement. And if you're not part of a community, you're being disobedient and you need to repent. There are no growing Christians normally, under normal conditions, there are no growing Christians apart from an active life in the body of Christ. And even if you read about people in prison, people like Richard Wormbrandt, the fellowship that they had together, even through the walls of the prison, was necessary for their sanctification. A clear evidence of your sanctification is how you're thinking about others more, more and more and more than yourself. That's an indication of your sanctification. Our sanctification is intimately bound, our holiness, sanctification, holiness, same thing. Our holiness is intimately bound to our love, care, concern, and service to others. We are in this together. Paul Tripp writes, the Christian experience is deeply relational. Community is counterintuitive, but the Bible teaches that it's mandatory to the life of faith. God has not called us to live in isolation as believers. He unites us to Christ and places us within a community of faith where we are, where we influence one another in profound ways. Remember all those one another passages. 50 of them in the New Testament. Grace abounds in community. Now look at verse 15, and you can see clearly that we each have a duty here to help one another in our pursuit of holiness. We're commanded in verse 15, look what it says, see to it 
that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. Fails to obtain could be tr translated also falls short of. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. This is not saving grace, by the way. The context here is not see to it that everyone in the world gets saved. This is not a reference to evangelism of the non-Christian. But, but this is occurring among those who are in the same race. It's the, it's the weak knees and the, and the drooping hands. Those who are becoming weary. He's saying, see to it that none of them fail, that none of them fall short. It is by the grace of God that we're saved. Grace gets us into the race. And it is also the grace of God by which we finish the race. That's why he talks about here, um, no one fails to obtain the grace of God. Same grace that saves enables us to persevere and run the race to the end. And God is saying, I am using each of you to look out for one another. Look out for those who are weak in this fight, those who are going through temptation, so that they would not fall short or forsake the grace that they had obtained. But alas... Sadly, not everyone is going to make it. Verse 15 does continue. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. That goes on. No root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. What is this root of bitterness? Now many, just take this verse, take it completely out of context, and just talk about some internal psychological disorder that's the result of repressed anger. And they call it a root of bitterness. And they say to the Christian, don't get bitter, you're going to defile many. But we can't just do that. When you see a term in scripture, you can't just interpret it in light of modern day psychology. <laughs> we need to let scripture interpret scripture. So you have a context which tells you what the root of bitterness is, as well as you have the same term being used elsewhere in the scripture, which is going to tell us undeniably what's, what's being referred to here. So how do you do that? When you, face, you read something in Scripture, your initial inclination is, oh, this must mean internal bitterness. What you do is you take the term out and you put a variable in. You put an X, and then you solve for X. And that remove, what, what, do, what putting X in is it removes the bias. You see the words root of bitterness, and you're going to interpret it in light of modern day psychology or modern day Christian pulpits or books that you've read about bitterness and anger. Which, which aside, of course, bitterness is wrong, but that's not what it's referring to here. So you put X in. And so oh, let's read it with X in verse 15. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no X springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled. The two sentences are linked, and they're linked by the word that. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no X springs up and causes trouble. So now solving for X, we just place in one for the other, and we see that X is the one who fails to obtain grace. X is the person who apostatizes, falls away from the faith, and leads others astray. That's the root of bitterness. The author's already warned about this in chapter 3, verse 13. He says, take care, brothers, lest there be in you, literally among you, an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. So a root of bitterness is not a feeling, it's not an internal sin, but it's a person or a group of people who defile others. And this is further made crystal clear by looking at the same term elsewhere in Scripture. Turn to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 29, this is where the root of bitterness comes from, and it's going to clarify without a question what it's talking about. Deuteronomy 29, verses 18 and 19. It says, Beware, 
lest there be among you a man or a woman or clan or tribe whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of those nations. Beware. Okay, he says, beware, lest there's this people or person or people who are going to serve other gods. Beware, parallel, lest there be among you, same, same language, a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit, one who, when he hears the words of the sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall be safe, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. This will lead to the sweeping away of moist and dry alike. So the text in Deuteronomy is warning Israel of a people, a person or a people, who are right in their midst, who turn away from following God to follow other gods. Saying they are the poisonous, bitter root, particularly as they claim that their sin does not disqualify them from the kingdom of God. So they're sitting boldly right in the midst of Israel, and he's calling it a bitter root. In Hebrews, we find that this bitter root, referring again to people who abandon the faith, we find out, find out that it defiles many. In short, a bitter root is a person or people who forsake the assembly, even falling away from the faith, taking others with them, defiling many. Convincing others that their sin is actually right or their false doctrine is actually right. The sad illustration of this bitter root is found in the person Esau. Another indication that it's a person. Esau is the bitter root. Remember, Esau had a lack of concern for the things of God. He disdained his birthright. Look back to the middle of verse 15. That no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. Esau was a child of the chosen heir of Isaac. He was a twin. He was the firstborn in line to receive the inheritance and the birthright, to continue the promised lineage. But he had little regard for heavenly matters and he was bound by ungodly and earthly priorities. And he thought so little of his birthright that he actually gave it away for a bowl of lentils. And when it came time to receive the blessing, Esau couldn't get the blessing, though as we see here, he sought it with tears. Look again at verse 17. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, and he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Most agree here that what Esau is seeking with tears was not necessarily repentance, but the blessing. Uh, there seems to be no indication that Esau desired to really repent of his carnal folly, but rather that he regretted the loss of his birthright, the loss of his stature, and he, was, and he was wanted it back, and that's, that was the source of his tears. But even if Esau sought repentance with tears, the sad story tells us, as was said by someone, even our tears of repentance must be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Esau serves as a warning to awaken us to danger. By mentioning him, the author is reiterating the warnings that he's been warning from the beginning of the book of Hebrews, warning in four, chapter 4, verse 1. He says, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of us should seem to have failed to reach it. Or the warning of Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6. Esau, this speaks of Esau and, what, and, and the report of the author on Esau. It says, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who've tasted of the heavenly gift, who shared in the Holy Spirit, tasted of the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm 
holding him up to contempt. Esau illustrates the apostate who fails to attain the grace of God, who does not finish the race. How do we seek to apply this to our church? There may be some in our church who are headed in the direction of Esau. May not be blatantly obvious, but they're struggling. They're weak. They're tempted and doubting. And without intervention, they just may become like Esau. We must intervene. Do what we can to keep that from happening to our brother, to our sister. When we see a brother or sister in our church headed in the way of ungodly Esau, straying from the highway of holiness, we all bear a mutual responsibility to one another to exhort them to return to the narrow path. Now, verse 16 mentions one particular sin that is often mentioned in Scripture, sexual immorality. For then, as now, this particular sin was a big problem in society and was coming into the church as well. Therefore, it is our duty as a church to maintain the purity of the flock. Sins of a sexual nature must particularly be dealt with. All sins, but it mentions here particularly sexual immorality, must be dealt with in three ways as a church. And I've listed them in your bulletin, I believe, in your, yeah, I think so. Yeah, at the front door, in the assembly, and at the back door. Let's explain what I mean by this. The front door, in the assembly, and out the back door. First, the front door. We must guard the front door. What's the front door of the church? The front door of the church is membership, baptism. Now, we want to be very open to anyone who wants to come and visit the church and hear the word preached. Praise the Lord. Anyone can come and hear the word. But we must be selective and careful as a church as to who we baptize and who we receive into membership. Now, we, quite honestly, were not always so careful in the past. I take personal responsibility for allowing tares into this flock among the wheat. Some who were not of us crept into our membership and caused a lot of trouble in our midst because our membership process, our front door, was not as tight as it should have been. And we have made efforts to rectify this. One way is that the decision is not only up to the elders, that the decision is before the entire church. So when we have a new member coming in, we have a baptismal candidate coming in, we send out their names to the church for consideration. We all share concerns for one another because there are things that the elders don't know or can't see, but you might be aware of. So we all share our concerns of who comes in the front door. And if we're going to obey this command that says, see to it that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, that many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy, we must guard that front door and we must encourage holy living of all of our members. How do, how do we do that? Well, first, we don't neglect the preaching of holiness. We don't neglect preaching the fear of God. Hebrews 12, 28 speaks of God as a consuming fire. You don't hear that much anymore. The holiness of God as a consuming fire is a neglected doctrine in the church today in an effort to become relevant and practical, God's holy character and nature has been all but neglected. Al Martin said, most of the evangelical church is rotten to the core because its aim in, is happiness, not holiness. But in the early church, in the book of Acts, the fear of God was upon them, right? What did it say? None dared join them. Unless it was the Spirit of God calling them, none dare join them. So in our preaching, we must not neglect exhortation, application of God's principles and of His laws. 
In many churches in our day, there's a temptation to dumb that part of the Word of God down, to dumb down the imperatives, be winsome, make entry into church membership fluid and easy, not even caring if the, if the member is regenerate or not. It's all about making your number. It's all about paying your bills. And may we, by the grace of God, be different. It's only by the grace of God if we are. I, I, I feel I, I would rather go broke as a church than compromise and risk gaining false brethren and losing true brethren. I'd have no trouble if Bread of Life was a church that was defined as none dare join them for the right reasons. And I understand this is not easy. What, what we're calling for here, the whole body life that we're calling for here is difficult. It, it requires you to get your hands dirty. It requires people to see into your lives. But we must encourage this, brothers and sisters. We must encourage holy living, not only in our preaching, but in our fellowship as well. Sometimes things can happen within the context of church membership, and, and you know another brother in the church, and, and you're the only one who knows his life because you see him or you're fellowshipping or, or there's something going on, and sometimes they'll fall into sin. You can't be like Cain and say, I, I'm not my brother's keeper. Who am I to judge? That's not my job. We need to exhort one another and encourage one another and confront one another and look for repentance and restoration. Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual. It doesn't say the elders necessarily, but you who are spiritual. In other words, you've been given grace in an area, you are a spiritual, restore him in the spirit of gentleness. This is the way we bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. So we guard holiness at the front door. We guard it in our fellowship, one with another. And then in some cases, when sin becomes so clear and efforts to bring one to repentance have gone on and on and on, unheeded and even spurned at times, that's when you open the back door. The back door, remove the person from church membership. That's church discipline. Matthew 18. I don't have time to get into it today. Most of you here, I know you know that. We have utilized Matthew 18. It's in our church constitution that is to put that person out who will not repent. And when a new member comes in, we inform them. This is something we practice. This is a biblical practice that we do. We inform, inform them up front so that they know that this is a place where they're going to be held accountable for their sin. Brothers and sisters, may this be us by the grace of God. May our sermons, our classes, our prayer meetings, our fellowships be filled with these pursuits. And God will add to our number those who are saved. I was at a uh, pastor's meeting a few weeks ago, and the pastor's table I was sitting at was sharing a testimony about a church discipline case in their church. And as a result of this church discipline case, a large number of people left the church. But people had just come into the church and witnessed that church discipline and said, this is where we need to be. This is where we want to be. So God will add to the, to the number those who are being saved. Fill yourself with these pursuits. Pursue the weak. Pursue peace. Pursue holiness. And may our fellowship be characterized by exhortation, cheering one another on, saying, you can make it. Let's go, Scott. Let's go, Adamos. Let's go, Molinaros. Let's go, Scarpatis. Let's go. Let's go. Put in your name. Pursue peace and holiness. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy in saving us. Please bless this word for your purposes, that your word would not return void, but would accomplish what you desire it to. In Jesus' name. Call up, or, or Brother Rob is going to lead us in a prayer of closing prayer of confession.
forgive us any spirit of isolation and selfishness, Lord God, and self-centeredness that neglects the brethren, causes us to neglect the body of the Christ, the, the body of Christ and the one another verse um, commands in your word, Lord God. Forgive us, Lord, for any sinful spirit of independence and just being distant, Lord, from our brethren who are mm. supposed to be our family. It's just mm. having a distant spirit, mm. Lord, because of wrong priorities, Lord. Lord, mm. any wrong priorities we have that are just not consistent with that of a disciple who claims to be part of your body, Lord God, forgive us. Lord, anything regarding pursuing peace, Lord, when we fall short, forgive us. Forgive us for not actively seeking to be involved in pursuing and promoting peace in the body of Christ, Lord God. And especially forgive us for any times where we ourselves may have been sources of division mm -hmm. because of our own self-centered uh, motivations, mm -hmm. Lord God. And Lord God, forgive us for neglecting the pursuit of holiness the way we are to pursue it, Lord God. Lord, forgive us for not being actively involved in promoting the holiness and pursuing the holiness not only of ourselves but of our brethren. <clears throat> forgive us, Lord God, if any way our negligence and our own unbelief and our own personal walks has been a source of defilement to others mm. and has been a cause of stumbling for others, Lord God, in the body. Lord, forgive us for any hint of flirtation with sexual sin, mm. whether it's something we do outwardly with our hands or our actions, or whether it's even in our mind, Lord. Even a hint of it, Lord, for even tolerating it for a moment, forgive us. And Lord, please forgive us anything in our heart that resembles the heart of Esau, Lord, mm. who cared for a morsel of temporary passing food of this temporary passing world more than the eternal blessing. Because it's from such a heart that we neglect the body. Mm. That we don't pursue the one another's Lord. Because we're not pursuing the eternal things. The eternal blessing will help us not to be a people who are more consumed by the things of this world. Than your eternal promise, Lord God. Thank you that you've given us such a wonderful and eternal promise. Thank you that you've given us such a great salvation from judgment, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. And such a hope of eternal life. Mm. And may that hope pure, uh, cause us, Lord, to be pure. Yes. Because whoever has this hope purifies himself. Mm. Yes. Thank Even you. as you are pure, Lord, help us, Lord, to fix our eyes on the hope, and may that hope mm. cause us to love one another mm. and you. serve eternal things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll just take a couple of minutes now to prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, to pray mm. quietly, confess your sins and prepare your hearts for the table.
You're welcome to join us at the table if you are born again, baptized, and part of a sound evangelical church. However, you should refrain from participating if you're practicing willful, unrepentant sin, have significant, unresolved conflict with another member. If you are, however, displeased with yourself because of your sins, but are nevertheless trusting that you're pardoned and the suffering and death of Christ covers your sin, then please do join us at the table. You'll come forward as during the next two songs in our songbook, number 142, Take My Life, and number 42, Do This in Remembrance of Me. meditating on what was just given to us by God's word. Let's stand now and sing Take My Life. And again, followed by Do This in Remembrance of Me. Oh, 
This is my body given for you. This is the cup that holds the blood of a new covenant. This is forgiveness, simple and true. This is the way that I have made for you. So before you received an exhortation today to pursue, to pursue the weak, to pursue peace, and to pursue holiness. And if you're not clear what that pursuit looks like after that sermon, or if you don't desire that pursuit, mm. then you need to be concerned deeply, because our passage stated today that without that pursuit of God on the highway to holiness, we're not going to see the Lord. And as we heard, that pursuit is not the attainment of a certain level of holiness, but it's the pursuit of God through the gospel of peace. We're called to these same imperatives that the Hebrews were called to, as followers of Christ, those who are in Christ, were called to those same imperatives. But those who are in Christ also have those same indicatives that the author of the Hebrews gave in chapter 3, where it says, holy brethren and partakers of a heavenly calling. We who are in Christ can make progress in our pursuit of God because God has shown his light into our hearts, and he's given us new life. Amen? Thank you, Lord. And as we come to the Lord's table, week by week we come confessing our shame, mm. confessing our sin, confessing our guilt, our inability to make any progress in the pursuit of God. We can't do it 
in our own capacity. And we come to the table and we find peace with God because of what God has done for us in his sacrifice on the tree. His body broken, his blood shed, and we take his righteousness, we take his goodness, we take his holiness as our own in the gospel. There is forgiveness, and this is our forgiveness. This is our holiness. It's simple and true. There's no other way. This is the way that he's made for you. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that in these symbols of the broken body and the shed blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus, that in this promise our sins are covered and you count us as righteous, you count us as saints, you count us as a beloved children, and we could say to one another, let's go, and we can make progress in our pursuit of you. We give thanks to you for Christ, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's partake together. fitting song now to end our service with let's sing about encouraging one another to keep the faith and run this race
closing benediction, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Amen. Amen. Um, you, uh, just quick, quickly, a uh, couple of weeks we have our Agape Fellowship, uh, not next Sunday, but following Sunday. Uh, invite people out to that. That's a great opportunity to invite people to come and meet people and fellowship together. Uh, that's our special one for Thanksgiving. It's always a highlight. Uh, and anything else? That's Prayer meeting is downstairs. We have uh, food downstairs, so join us. And, I'm, and we'll begin around 2.15. We're praying downstairs, so we'll, we'll clean up and pray right downstairs. Please join us for fellowship down there. And that's it. Break up and greet one another.